When we see patients with bronchiolitis, identifying the sick ones is pretty easy to do, but actually what we want to do is identify which ones are going to get worse, which ones we need to admit, and which ones we need to observe for a bit longer in the emergency department. Here are my top five tips on how to manage bronchiolitis well. Assess the feeding. The feeding is a really important element to how well this baby and infant is going to do and whether you need to keep them in or send them home. So we have this classic, you should be feeding at least 50% of your feeds. If the baby's bottle feeding, then you can make an estimate of that because the parents will know how much they normally take. Um, if the baby's breastfeeding, you're not going to be able to make an exact assessment. So you need some other things to help you evaluate how effective the feeding is. With breastfeeding, the parent will be able to tell you whether they feel that the baby's feeding for the same length of time or longer or more frequently, whether they feel full after the feed or whether they feel they still have a lot of milk left. Often what we see with babies with bronchiolitis is that they feed more frequently but less volume each time, so whichever way they're feeding that they will have uh, feeds that happen more frequently. Sometimes the feed might take a bit longer because they're doing it more slowly or they might have short frequent feeds. All of these are okay as long as they're getting a, around or at least 50% of their feed. Another good way to measure this is by thinking about how many wet nappies they're having because parents know how often babies normally have wet nappies and also they often pick up the nappy so they know like how heavy it feels compared to normal. So if they feel the baby's still having a good amount of wet nappies, then that's a reassuring sign that they're getting enough feeds. If you want to specifically calculate feeds, you can. So infants should be taking somewhere between 100 to 100 150 mils per kilo per day and you can divide that into the number of feeds they have in a 24-hour period and get an idea of what they should be having so you can work out if they're taking at least 50%. But mostly the parents will be able to give you a reliable estimate uh, with a combination of their feeding and their amount of wet nappies. Tip two, remember the higher risk babies. So there are some babies and infants who are at higher risk. That means higher risk of having a more severe version of bronchiolitis that needs admission. So with these infants, we're gonna have a lower threshold of when to admit them. So even if they look well or reasonably well, and you might send a similar baby with no risk factors home, then there's certain groups that you would be more cautious with and keep in. Risk factors are gonna be things like, were they premature? Were they born at less than 32 weeks? Are they very young? So babies who are less than three months with bronchiolitis, we're gonna have a lower threshold for admission or at least prolonged observation. Do they have chronic lung disease? That's gonna make them at higher risk of having a worse and more severe episode of bronchiolitis. Do they have a neuromuscular disorder or do they have an immunodeficiency? Do they have a congenital heart disease that's likely to impact on their risk? So these are all factors where you see an infant with these risk factors, then you're gonna be more cautious. It doesn't mean you have to admit them all, but it means you're gonna have a lower threshold compared to an infant without these risk factors. So think about these risk factors and be more careful with these infants. Three, the drugs don't work except oxygen. So no matter how tempted you are to try lots of different treatments with bronchiolitis, we've had plenty of studies and evidence that makes it very clear that none of them work. A trial of salbutamol is not something you should be doing. Salbutamol is not going to work. No amount of nebulizers, drops, antibiotics, steroids, adrenaline, whatever else it is that you might be thinking is worth a try, they don't make any difference. So don't try any medications in these infants with bronchiolitis. Now, what saline drops can do is they can help clear the, the baby's nose so that during the next feed, it may be that they're able to breathe a bit more easily through their nose and therefore can take a better feed. It doesn't affect the, the pattern of bronchiolitis. It's not going to have any impact on how much better they're gonna get or how much sicker they're gonna get. It's simply a temporary relief. That's the only thing that I do try sometimes, but otherwise, there's nothing else that you should be doing and nothing else that's going to make any difference to the path that the bronchiolitis is going to take. Having said that, there are two things that can be useful at times, oxygen and high flow. So we should be using oxygen to supplement for babies who've got low sats and your cutoff as to what the low sats are will vary depending on your guidelines, but it's likely to be somewhere between 90 and 92%. The NICE guidelines that recently came out said that in an under six week old, you should keep the SATs above 92, but in an over six week old baby or infant, you could tolerate SATs uh, 90 or above. So we're somewhere around 
that line. Certainly, if you're into the 80s, you should be putting on supplemental oxygen. If you're in the low 90s, it's going to depend on the age of the child and your local guidance. But if they're low, put on supplemental oxygen. High flow is the next thing that's really useful. Uh, we've got great resources on DFTV, which I'll link to about when to start high flow and how to. Um, high flow is good if you've got a baby who's, who's working hard, who might need some extra support and uh, it can be a really useful intervention and we, I do see patients turn around uh, within an hour or so after having started on high flow, so keep that in your back of your mind. It's going to depend on what you have available, uh, if you have high flow, if you can start it, who can start it and when, but this is a, an intervention that can be useful in babies who are more unwell with their work of breathing with bronchiolitis. And the other intervention that might be helpful is help with feeding. So when babies are breathing really fast, they don't always have an ability to take oral feeds. You may need to supplement this with NG feeds or IV fluids, and your guideline will tell you how to decide this and when, but it's an option there for babies who are, are breathing too fast or who are not taking adequate feeds. My fourth top tip is know your discharge criteria. You want to know when you're discharging a child that you're doing it safely. And you're going to have to ensure that some of the key things that we worry about with bronchiolitis are okay with your baby. You're gonna want to make sure that they're not having apneas. Apneas is gonna be a red flag that you're probably likely to admit. You want to make sure that the baby's feeding well. So are they taking at least half of their normal feeds? Have you seen them have a good feed in the department or do they have a plan for how to feed more frequently so that they get more volume in over a 24 hour period. You want to make sure they're having good wet nappies. You will want to make sure that their oxygen saturations are adequate and that will be over a period of time. The NICE guidelines suggest it should include a period of sleep. I don't know how practical that always is in an emergency department, but certainly if you can see that, then that's reassuring that even during a period of sleep, they are maintaining their sats. And you want to make sure that overall they're stable. So it's a well looking child that all of these things are stable over a period of time. We can see a snapshot if we have a brief consultation, but it's often very helpful to see them over a period of hours. And that will give us a good idea of how they're feeding, how their hydration status, what their behavior is like, and how worried we are about their respiratory effort. Respiratory effort is going to be really important to discharge and it usually has a knock-on effect on the other factors. So if you've got a child with uh, who's working very hard, you're likely to have seen that they're not feeding well or that their sats are low. But make sure you look at their work of breathing, their respiratory rate, what their recession's like and the rest of your respiratory examination when you have a listen. And five, make sure you safety net well. That means that you are comfortable, that the family feel confident to look after their baby at home, that they want to go home and that they know how to recognise the signs and when and how to return or seek further medical help. So you're going to be telling them of things to look out for when they when they go home because we know that bronchiolitis may get worse before it gets better. We know that it's usually worse around day three, four, so depending on where in the illness the child is at the moment, it may get worse before it gets better and the family may have to come back and that's okay as long as they know when to do that appropriately. So they should be looking out for worsening work of breathing, problems with feeding, certainly if the baby's lethargic, if the baby's not having wet nappies, these are the things, or having any apneas, these are the things that they should be looking out for and should be seeking a medical review for. This safety netting period is a good time to give some smoking cessation advice. You should be asking them who's smoking at home or around the home uh, because that is going to have a negative impact on the baby's respiratory status. We need to encourage families to stop smoking and also to explain to them about the impact of the smoking on their child's infection. And make sure that you're happy and the parents are happy so that you're happy that the parents understand what they need to recognise, what red flags they need to look out for and also that they feel confident that they can do that and know what to do. So if they live hours away from the nearest hospital hospital it might actually not be appropriate to discharge them if you think the baby's going to deteriorate or if they're not sure how to get help or you know they're on holiday visiting somewhere else or whatever it is then you may change your plan based on their ability to access healthcare. but if you're happy they're confident and they're happy then they know what to look out for and what to do then 
that's a good safety netting. Make sure you give them some written discharge advice. You're going to have an uh, information leaflet and there's plenty online if you can't find one so that they don't forget the stuff because it's easy when you're being overwhelmed with information to just forget about it afterwards. Giving some written information is really helpful. These top five tips are my key things that you need to know about managing bronchiolitis safely and well. If you like this, check out our video on how to examine a newborn, which you can see here.